This is the Fatty Joe Show, coming to you from Casa de Cary, deep in the forests of Nutmegerville. This show is dedicated to exploring pathways to better health from a holistic perspective. In each episode, we will explore such topics as nutrition, mental and emotional health, fitness, and more. I'm Yogi, your host, and I became interested in studying health after conventional health dogma became damaging and led me to become massively overweight. Against modern convention, I went on a keto lifestyle and I lost over 300 pounds and gained a level of control on my personal health that I never had before. Now I'm on a journey to find out what is myth and what is truth in the ever convoluted world of what is considered healthy. Come join me on a journey of discovery as I look for a path to improve total health. If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash the fatty Joe show or patreon.com slash Carrie Brown. If you want to check out all of our social media links and recipes, head to carriebrown.com. Don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fatty Joe Show. Uh, I got to tell everybody before we start, I am extremely grateful uh, for the opportunities that I've had on the show so far. I've got to interview some incredible people for everyone from Gary Taubes to people that helped me start like Michael Rutherford and Ted Naiman. And now I have another person on the show who was one of the people that actually inspired me to get out more and through his videos actually kind of taught me how to shop at the stores to make sure that I could find keto stuff when I was on the road. This guy is, uh, I'd like to say, a YouTube legend, and a, uh, he's definitely a, a rock star in the nutritional world and the fitness world, and he has a, his own podcast, and I want to introduce Thomas DeLauer. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on to the Fatty Joe Show. Man, it's awesome to be here, man. Your story is so incredible, and it's it's an honor to be able to be a part of this and, and, uh, and give back a little bit, man, because your story and your just your thanks to me just hit me hard and it's it's i'm just happy to help you out and help you to do this well thank you man i I really appreciate it and and uh you know this is this show i i found a fitness journey kind of by accident i was listening to a radio show but i realized all the resources that i i've learned over time i learned from all these incredible people and so the people that were following me were asking me questions that I learned from other people. And I'm like, I got to get these people on this show so that they can teach the same information that I got over. Uh, and, and your, your, your videos watching you work out one get, you know, you were one of the workout people. I, I got, a, you know, inspired going, dude, I want to be like hiker ready. Like, you know, like Thomas looks and uh, not be hauling myself around. Cause that's one of my passions. I love to go backpacking. And I was like, you know what? I, I need to get, my size down. I need to, 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 to be better so I can actually fit some gear and, uh, and also not be out of breath tackling my first hill. Yeah. So what got you started on, on this fitness journey and, and being the guru that you are, what's your superhero origin story? <laughs> well, so it's funny because, you know, people call me a guru like that. And it's like, I, I always try to, I, there's that, what that Tony Robbins documentary on Netflix from a few years ago. He says, I am, you know, I am not your guru. Right. And like, I try to, I try to say that too. I'm like, I'm not your guru. I think what I am is just, I have an ability to articulate subject matter in a way that gets people excited and passionate about it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert. I mean, I, I am by default because I, I read a lot and I learn a lot and I self-experiment a lot. But I think my gift is being able to excite people and get people amped up about it. And I've lean, I'm le- I lean into that because I don't, I don't want to be an expert. I don't want to be that guy. I, 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 like, I don't want to be a know-it-all. I want to be the guy that just inspires and helps people and spreads positivity that way because I wasn't fortunate enough to grow up in a super positive environment. And I want to be able to now take some of that you know, negative energy out of my, my former life, if you want to call it that, and, and propel it forward. So, I mean... But my call to action, my superhero story, if you want to call it that, was, um, man, I was, I was in the corporate world, the typical corporate grind. 
uh, not even for long. Fortunately, it didn't take me long to realize that I needed to change. But uh, I went from being an athlete. I was an athlete in high school, athlete in college. Uh, and I, I, you know, I worked out a lot. I tried to put on muscle as best I could and really just got fat when I tried. But then, um, and I'm sure I put on some good muscle there too. But then what happened was mild level of financial success kind of at a young age. And I thought that I was the coolest dude in the world, thought my instinct, I thought, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm 22 and I've got the world by the balls and I can do whatever I want because I'm making this money. And, and then next thing you know, I mean, I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. I'm not working out anymore, but I'm eating like I'm working out. And granted, I mean, I still had some good muscle. I mean, I looked like a, um, I looked like someone that was like, how do I put this? like those football coaches that uh, you could tell at one point they used to play ball and then they just stopped working out and they just kept eating like they were working out. That was me, except I was you know too young to really have that excuse. Um, so the long and the short of it is given the industry that I worked in, uh, I had some really good physicians by my side. I had some really good healthcare professionals by my side that weren't the typical mainstream healthcare docs. They weren't those guys because that wasn't the industry I was in. I was in a world called concierge medicine where at the time I, I was kind of on the medical sales kind of side, but, um, you know, so these were doctors that were working with patients on a fee for service model where they weren't having to go through the insurance continuum. So the long and the short of that means that these patients need, uh, were paying these doctors like a retainer, you know, out of pocket. So if the doctors didn't perform for them, they didn't really get results. Right. So they would fire the doctor. So the point is the doctors were always looking at alternative pathways and dietary structures to actually truly help their patients get healthy. So, cause I know a lot of people that could be listening are saying, well, what, what does a doctor know? And most of them, I will say like most of the modern day docs are, yeah, they're not well versed in this stuff, but these were different doctors at that time. And they turned me on to the ketogenic diet. And, and I, so I learned it, what, you know, over 10 years ago and I have stuck with it since. I mean, yes, I've come off and on strategically, but then I learned that but wait a minute, after I went through my transformation, after I lost 100 pounds or over 100 pounds, I realized that uh, my story resonated with people. There was a lot of people that were just kind of stuck in that corporate grind and they just didn't know how to get out of it. And uh, that alone is a battle for people, let alone the health struggle that goes along with it. And uh, my timing was well, was good with getting on the covers of some magazines because it was a goal of mine to uh, be on a fitness magazine cover sometime, which I will tell you, is not all that glamorous. It's not what people think it is. It's, 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 you know, it's just, it is what it is. But anyhow, the timing was perfect with that. I went through a transformation. I got some magazine covers and I was discovering that my gift was the ability to articulate what I went through and the biochemistry that was along with it. And all that was a perfect storm where people wanted to hear it. Um, so it was, I mean, for lack of a better term, it was truly finding my calling. My, find, my calling was being able to inspire and empower people uh, through my ability to articulate biochemistry, <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, you're you're a teacher, man, and that's that's something that's really awesome. You know, it, it's it's rare in this world to find a good teacher to follow and, and to that can explain to so many people in a way that they can understand it. And what you've done, which really impressed me when I was on the road, is. When you listen to a lot of the, the keto podcasts and the nutrition podcasts, they're constantly talking about grass-fed beef and this and that. And for many people, a lot of this stuff isn't accessible. And I've watched you take us along to the store on YouTube at Walmart and show us what's accessible in a keto diet or a nutritional standpoint diet of, of the healthier choices that are available to you. And I think that's absolutely amazing that, that you do that kind of thing, because that's, it's not necessarily the message that a lot of people have in the keto space. That's, you know, that was what I really wanted to tackle, frankly, was the ketogenic diet has a reputation as being for only highly affluent people. And the reputation comes along with the leaders that are paving the way with it. And that's not a bad thing per se, because I mean, yes, wealthy people need to eat healthy too, but like you can't be preaching all of these unattainable things. And so I always try to bridge the gap and help people understand what could work for them with what's in reach for them. 
and do it in a way that's not condescending. You know, you walk into Walmart and you say, hey, this is cool. Walmart has some really good options. You just have to know what to look for. And you just have to know how to read a label. And you have to understand that a lot of these companies are getting, or these retailers are getting their meat from the same place. They're just slapping different labels and different price tags on it. So uh, if you know how to read a label and you understand the sourcing, the power is in your hands. And pick your pick your battles. You know, some foods you do want to spend the extra money on some, it's not worth it. Like I talk about like with asparagus, asparagus is a clean food. You don't have to spend the money on getting it organic, right? Things like that. Whereas there's other foods like eggs. Yeah. You might want to spend a couple bucks on getting the right eggs because the potential negative impact of a bad egg is much worse than the potential negative impact of a bad piece of asparagus, things like that. We, we have to brought, we have to make this accessible for everybody. Otherwise, we're always going to be pigeonholed into our little corner and we're never going to be able to truly get this message out there. Yeah, I, I firmly agree. And I, there's a lot of people that I saw in the trucking industry that fell off the wagon because one, it wasn't accessible. And two, they thought they had to buy all this expensive stuff. So when they didn't have access to it, they just gave up. And, and it's, this is not just a true story in the trucking industry, but this is like everybody, you know, you get people living in, fairly food desert type areas that that don't think they can get healthier foods that you got that but having somebody out there that shows them the pathway to do it like you are reading the labels and things like that it's just then from a matter it's just getting the mindset into them to actually take those steps 100 percent, 100 percent. and at the time of recording this podcast right now you probably have seen it but i mean my leading video on youtube right now is how to do keto at the dollar tree um, and I don't know if you've seen that video, but I mean, for $30 a week, I show people between 20 and $30 a week, you can do keto and you can do it well. And it's, it, and that's why is, you know, why is that video blowing up? Because there's demand for it. And there's, you, you have to be able to educate and, and elevate. I think elevates the word that I like to use a lot because again, it's, it's gotta be attainable for people. And not only is it attainable, but it's sustainable. Like, yes. you know, if, if, if you're going to make health changes in your diet, it can't be a temporary thing. You can't just go, I'm going to make these changes that, you know, to get myself back down to, let's say I'm going to lose 100 pounds on these changes. But then if you go back the other way, you're just going to end up back in the same place. Mm -hmm. And we know yo-yo dieting like that is, is probably even more harmful than just being overweight. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's so true. I mean, attainable and sustainable. And um, you know, when you're, that's why I, I love that there's so many different options coming out for people with keto, but at the same time, it can sometimes be a detriment, but people, again, they have to just have this understanding that once they start this, they can continue. And I know a lot of people and, you know, like my people within my own family specifically will say, I'm afraid to start this because I don't want to just get stuck on, you know, a few specific foods and never be able to branch out and not be able to do it or be stuck being tied to $500 a month in groceries. Um, you know, I can't sustain that. I might be able to do it for a few months, but how am I supposed to continue to do this forever? And being able to spread that message that, I mean, that's again, <laughs> where intermittent fasting can come in too, right? That's, I mean, yeah. no way to save money a little bit better than to just skip a meal. But um, yeah, I fully agree, man. Good point. You know, and what one of the things that impresses me too with your delivery and everything, you very much have that engineer's mindset, the same kind of mindset that came out of Silicon Valley, the same kind of mindset you see from guys like Dave Feldman and Ivor Cummers, Cummings. You look at holistic uh, uh, systems in the body. You look at holistic, and not just the systems in the body, but like we said, how to make things sustainable. But you're looking at the whole picture and, and getting things to work in with the, the biochemistry, with the gut health, with the fitness, with everything. You are such a well-rounded person on that. And it's, it's really awesome to watch. When you're doing your coaching and you're, you're helping people get to where they need to be or what their goals are, do you parlay as, as best you can that that um, the, that philosophy of looking at whole systems of fixing the body of of things, or do you just go right into the fitness? That's a good question. That really does depend on the individual uh, because it, it, for people that 
I always say that education leads to adherence. And I have a sales background. I mean, I, I did that. And anyone that watches my videos will say, oh, Thomas is a tremendous salesman. And I guess I, I'm decent at it. But I also like what I'm selling is a process. I'm not, you know, yes, yes, I have sponsors on my channel, but that's not the goal. The goal is I'm selling a process. I'm selling you into trying a new lifestyle or trying something that's better for you. Um, so with that, I mean, you are the ability to see like what is going to make someone tick, but also being able to cast a big enough net where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're grabbing the interest of a lot of people. So it's different on an individual level. You know, if someone is coming to me for, for coaching and they feel like they just need the pro they just need the process. They don't really care. I get concerned that someone like that isn't going to be sustainable because what I've learned in business and what I've learned in, in health is that you have to fall in love with the process because in the process and the education that goes along with it, because even if you get to your goal weight, like people, they get there and then they get depressed because what's next, right? It, you have to fall in love with the process and why you're doing something. And sincerely, that is how I'm able to keep going myself. Like I reached my goal weight and I'm the kind of mentality that's like, well, what now? What do I do now? And it would be easy for me to get depressed because, okay, now what do I do? Go climb Mount Everest? What do I do? Like, I just want to keep going. But for me, I fall in love every single day with the process and learning something new about how my body works and learning something new about what's happening when I eat something. And every day I try to learn one new thing, at least about what's happening inside my body because it's infinite. We can just learn forever. Mm -hmm. And most people want that. They want to feel smart, right? And that's one thing I remember from like my sales training from my you know, corporate days was people always want to be elevated. And they always want to feel smart. They never want to be sold, but they always want to buy. So they always want to do something. They always want to improve themselves and learn, but they don't want to feel like someone's like telling them what to do per se. So that's how I try to do it with coaching or with my videos is I want them to feel empowered, like they're learning something new. So that they're excited to go try it out. And you're really tapping into a well that keeps going on forever because even researchers are constantly learning new things about physiology and biology. And, you know, a lot of the theories we're coming to find out we had on nutrition are not necessarily true across the board. And I think one of the big doors that's opening for people right now is the biodiversity of and how different things work in people. And I've noticed that when you talk on YouTube or, or, or I've seen some clips of you talking and, and giving speeches, you talk a lot about metabolic flexibility. You talk mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, just because you're keto, that doesn't mean you can't have this every once in a while. So tell me a little bit about how how you do this flexing, how you, um, and, and how important is that in, in to, to being metabolically flexible, to be in that, uh, for lack of a better term, that uh, hybrid car. Yeah, on the yeah road. that's perfect. And I've used exactly that reference is, you know, being the hybrid car that switches between gas and electric, gas and electric when it's time, right? Like it's, we have, um, our body creates cellular waste and sometimes it's going to create more. Sometimes it's going to be that, you know, DPF delete diesel right there where you just you're you're rocking and rolling with it right and I'm a Duramax guy so I know all about that but <laughs> and you're a trucker so you probably can relate but anyway you know and now I drive the Duramax with the deaf fluid that probably kills half of my performance and also kills some of the emissions and it's a load of crap let's have a separate gearhead podcast another day but, yeah <laughs> but metabolic <laughs> flexibility is about, okay, well, how do we get our cells to efficiently run on ketones or fat, but also not forget that our cells need glucose. And I, unfortunately, a lot of the mentality in some of the, the keto community, I shouldn't say all of it by any means, but some of it, they just go super dogmatic, like never touch a carb again, never do this because your carbs are going to do X, Y, Z to your cells. Well, metabolic flexibility is all about making sure that your body can be what we call dual fuel, have the ability to run on both fats and carbs. Because what good, you're putting yourself right back into you know, the kettle. You're jumping from pot to kettle if you're going so hardcore in keto that your body never has the ability to process glucose. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. If I've been doing keto for two years and then all of a sudden I start eating a bunch of carbohydrates, I'm going to feel like garbage. 
well, I'm not feeling like garbage because I simply have carbohydrates in my system. I'm feeling like garbage because my mitochondria and my cell are, are, are incapable of processing my glucose as well. I have become what is called glucose intolerant. And it means my blood sugar is going to remain elevated because the cells just, they just don't know how to process it. They virtually lose the machinery to process glucose properly because they're so what we call fat adapted. And in this small world that we live in sometimes with keto is we think, oh, well, why would I care? All I need is my body to burn fats and that's all I'll ever need. Well, there's still glycolytic processes that are no matter what going to require glucose. Your retinas are always going to require, require glucose. Certain parts of your brain will always require glucose. Okay. So when it comes down to that, how do we make it so our body can efficiently utilize glucose too? Well, occasionally we have to eat certain foods or we have to come off of keto for periods of time so that our body can be adapted to that as well so that we can switch back and forth. And once you're fat adapted, your body's going to easily get back into that ketogenic or fat adaptation mode. And the way that I explain it too is from a physiology standpoint with uh, anaerobic glycolysis and, and this whole process, if you were to go sprint right now, you're going to predominantly be using carbohydrates for fuel. It doesn't matter if you're in keto or not. If you're sprinting and you're working at a high intensity or you're bench pressing really heavy weight for eight, 10 reps, you're using carbohydrates for fuel, whether you're on keto or not. It's finding carbohydrates from other sources. It's breaking down proteins into carbohydrates, uh, glycerol, whatever. And then when you're running or you're doing aerobic work, that's not sprinting or heavy lifting, you're utilizing fat as a fuel source. So if your body is so conditioned to using fat as a fuel source, you start to kind of lose the efficiency of being able to use glucose. So imagine being uh, going out for a run and all of a sudden you hit a hill and you have to run up this hill, but it's gonna take a lot more effort. Well, that's gonna require you to utilize the glycolytic pathway to utilize carbohydrates. But if your cells aren't good at using carbohydrates, you're gonna find that you bonk running up that hill. And that's why so many people that do keto, they thrive with their endurance work, but their biggest complaint is I've lost my strength or I've lost my uh, ability to sprint. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is not because your glycogen stores are low, okay? Glycogen is the carbohydrates that are stored in your muscles. It's not because of that. You have plenty of glycogen, you do. Trust me, because your body creates it from other stores and other substrates and stores it in your muscles. It's not a glycogen issue, I promise you. It's a fuel delivery and a mitochondrial machinery issue. You hit that sprint, you hit that hill, and all of a sudden your cells say, okay, I'm not using fats anymore, I'm using carbs, but oh crap, I'm not good at using carbs, so you bonk. You have to condition your body to be able to use those carbs now and then, otherwise you'll never have the ability for that hybrid motor to properly shift. So in essence, if fats were the electric energy in a hybrid car and carbohydrates were the gas energy, you'd basically be running on hybrid power all the way up until about 70 miles an hour and not ever kick in your gas power until you hit 70. Whereas most hybrid cars, it kicks in around 25 or 30 miles per hour, um, giving you that extra horsepower, not necessarily torque, but <laughs> that's going to get into a whole different world. Simple analogy. And hopefully that makes sense, but you, you have to be flexible. Yeah. And, you know, like Gary Taub says, a calorie is not a calorie and a, you know, calorie one calorie is not the same as another calorie. And it's the same thing with carbs. It's what you carve up on is going to make a huge difference in, in how your body responds and your how efficiently you run as well. Something like, a sweet, something like a sweet potato is going to be much better than like, um, you know, even, even taking a potato and allowing it, cooking it and allowing it to cool and getting that resistant starch in there would probably be a lot better than having like a candy bar or one of those crappy protein bars sold by, you know, EXS or whatever it is, you know, that out there. Yeah. So you do um, a lot of work with clients and coaching and stuff. And you predominantly, from what I understand, you predominantly focus, uh, your, your clientele predominantly comes from the corporate world, right? But you, you work with other people as well. So what is, what is your coaching look like? What does it look like when somebody comes to you to get help yeah. without the rabbit out of the hat? Yeah, no, no, it's fine. And you know, I'm fully transparent on it. So, I mean, I don't do nearly as much coaching as I did in the years past, you know, so now it's kind of more, um, you know, I'll take on a couple people per quarter. So usually when I do work with someone in the coaching capacity, it's like, um, you know, almost a minimum 90 days that I require to work with someone because 
I'm all about testing. Like I, I like to be able to establish data points and determine things. And, and you can't just do that in a couple of weeks or a month. You know, you have to be able to, you can get people results really quickly, but you know, my biggest piece is I like to start with a baseline, very easy, minimal variability program where I can watch and determine what's working for people. And then most importantly, note deviations. Okay. What, what happens to your body? And are you recognizing a particular deviation? So if I were to put someone on XYZ plan and I were to say, um, okay, follow this to a T, but let me know every day, you know, weight, this sleep scale, this a bunch of different scales, energy scales, this um, reactiveness, how you're feeling in terms of like your ability to react to things. Are you too reactive? Are you not? Because these things all matter. And then let me know, has it, was there any deviation whatsoever from what I prescribed? And, you know, invariably there's going to be deviation. Oh, I uh, ran out of almond milk. So I added some heavy cream into it. Okay. You know, and then I noticed, okay, well, your weight went up two pounds overnight. Well, you didn't gain two pounds of fat. Okay. Because that would be 7,000 calories roughly in overage. So you didn't magically just create outside of any law of physics. You didn't, you know, you didn't just create two pounds out of thin air. You created two pounds because clearly you know, for the last four days, you've been having tremendous results. And then what's the one variable to add it in? You add it in the cream, right? Does that mean that cream is a terrible thing for that person? Not necessarily, but it starts telling us, okay, well, we know what's working. We know what's not working. We always say in, uh, you know, in our world, <laughs> we say in God, we trust and everything else. Give me data. That's, you know, that's what it's, it's like. You, you can't just trust anything. I want, you need to have some data. And then there's a little bit of trust that goes along with that. So that's a big piece of it. Um, of course, you, know, you can get into the tangible pieces of you know whether they're keto fasting, kind of what their protocol is. And yes, I do work you know a lot with more of the corporate kind of entrepreneurial piece of that. I, you know, I do some work with U.S. Special Forces as well, which is some really fun stuff. Uh, really being able to tap into what makes someone a top performer mentally and physically, because I am a firm believer, and I've said this many times before. Like the reason that I stick to the ketogenic diet is this is sustainable for sure, but mentally, uh, I love how it makes me feel. And if I feel good mentally, I make better choices every, in everything else. And it's a lot easier for me ad to adhere to a healthy lifestyle if I'm mentally clear. And that just naturally by law of attraction brings people that are high achievers to me. And, you know, and it's not just because I set a price point at that. It's because that's who I choose to work with because I want to work with people that are movers and shakers in the world because I like how they think and I like how they think about abundance with their bodies too, right? They think about uh, what am I capable of? What is my brain capable of? What is my body capable of? How far can I push it? And that's inspiring and motivating for me. So um, if I'm ever working with an individual person, it's obviously not the best uh, business scenario where you're trading time for dollars. So if I'm going to be doing that, it's going to be working with someone that I feel is going to be making a big impact. And how can I have a ripple effect by helping this person become more effective? If I'm helping, you know, our elite levels of, you know, personnel of the most elite levels of our military perform better, then I'm serving my country in a positive way. You know, so that's how I try to look at things. Or if I'm working with a certain, you know, the same practical scenario, which I have absolutely done, working with some of the top surgeons in our country. How do I make a neurosurgeon better? You know, I had a neurosurgeon come to me at one point because he said, uh, I need to figure out how I can be able to be more, most focused when I'm six hours in brain surgery. Like, you know, and like the fact that someone would come to me for that uh, is amazing. How do I help this person literally save lives? Um, it's a bigger ripple effect, if that makes sense. It actually does. And uh, there's a couple of things that I, I, I want to ask about. And first one is the reason why I started keto actually is because I was experiencing symptoms similar to CTE. Uh, I was 618 pounds. I walked across a truck scale, found that out when some guy yelled behind me, damn, you know, and uh, but I, I, I felt I was going to be the big guy. And what got me onto keto was actually I felt like my brain was underwater all the time. I was a former scuba driver and I, I literally felt like I had that pressure in my head. I was getting very forgetful. I was getting, um, my emotions were out of control. And I started learning a lot because my mentor was junior sale when I was in high school and I was playing football and into powerlifting. And then he had uh, committed suicide and it came out that he was experiencing symptoms of CTE. You can't get diagnosed unless you're 
but you know they autopsy your brain but i had i was getting the symptoms and that's why i went to keto and for myself i definitely have felt a difference in the brain right now i'm actually experimenting with exogenous ketones to see if i can't ramp that up a little bit um but your when you do the flex from keto to adding a little bit more carbs do you notice a difference in your brain performance yes 100 percent and this is something that I've talked about um, a little bit in some videos, but they're probably they're more esoteric videos that probably get buried, <laughs> you know, because it's mm -hmm. like I pump out so much, and then occasionally I put some really good nuggets that are in some crazy biochemistry esoteric thing. But what I've noticed in my own personal experience is that th there's a period of time coming off of keto where you are adding carbs in and you feel like absolute crap mentally, mm -hmm. and and I'll get to another point here in a minute, but what ends up happening is a couple weeks of that period, of that transition period, you are going to feel like garbage and then you start to feel a little bit better. Well, what ends up happening is that glucose intolerance that I talked about takes about two weeks for the mitochondrial matrix and the mitochondrial machinery to be able to kind of develop the ability to process the glucose again. And I've realized that, and then there's uh, this half-life effect that occurs with the mitochondria in terms of processing fats. What I'm saying is there's an overlap. So there's a period of, when I come off of keto for about a week and a half to two weeks, my brain is not that sharp. And then there's a period where my brain starts to get really sharp again, where it feels like I'm on keto again. However, I also have attained the benefits of running on carbohydrates too. I'm sweet in that dual field sweet spot. Then about two or three more weeks goes by and I realize I start to lose the brain effects again. And I become strong. I, I, I can lift a house in the gym at that time, but I start to lose the brain effects. And that's when it's time to come back on keto. So it sounds like a lot of work for a two week sweet spot because basically I come off keto, I'm crap for two weeks, and then I'm Superman for two to three weeks because I'm running on good on ketones and good on carbs. I shouldn't say ketones, but fat, I guess. And then, uh, and then it kind of gets into this phasing one week period where I feel like crap again, it's time to go on keto. So three or four weeks of dog crap to attain two weeks of superhuman feeling. Well, if you're trying to fine tune that to a specific period of time, example being a professional athlete that maybe has a, an event during that two week period, that's a perfect case. Um, you know, military needing to perform in a certain place or certain way, a certain time, absolutely. Um, now there's ways to kind of manipulate that. Uh, you know, the, the, I am careful to give advice, but you could always, you know, go to your doctor and things like, uh, you know, metformin is talked about a lot in terms of improving glucose, uh, glucose tolerance, things that I've experimented under the supervision of my doctor, adding metformin in to see if I can uh, improve my glucose tolerance so that I can come off of keto more effectively. Very, very, very tremendous success with that. I can't ever talk about it on YouTube. I can talk about it on podcasts because YouTube, you're not allowed to talk about a pharmaceutical at all, but these are things that you can do with, you know, the supervision of your doctor. Uh, anyhow, I only know that because we go in the super nerd route, but that point is that the brain definitely doesn't respond well because it's not used to using those carbs. And then it gets into the point where it's good at using those carbs again. And then it loses the ability to utilize the fats. So in other words, it only takes two weeks for the brain to get used to using carbs again, but it takes about six weeks for it to lose the ability to use those fats efficiently, if that makes sense. So you've got that overlap period where you get the sweet spot. Yeah, it does make sense. The other thing that struck me on this is, is knowing a little bit of the nutritional history it, the, what really changed our, our dietary guide, created the dietary guidelines was the fact that we had so many people underweight couldn't serve in the military. Yeah. Now that switched us to higher carbs, processed flour, things like that, that could get people bulked up so that they'd be healthy, mm -hmm. quote unquote, healthy by the standards of the time to get them out. Yeah. Now it seems like the military, especially in the special forces area, are starting to go more keto and experimenting with things around. Do you think that the more this catches on with the military, is this going to possibly lead into changes in our dietary guidelines in the U.S.? That's a tremendous question. Um, and, I, you know, it's been a philanthropic mission of mine to try to, you know, help the U.S. military change how they look at their, their rationing, you know, because it's mm -hmm. purely economically it makes sense to send troops overseas with fats versus carbs, because fats are gonna yield them nine calories per gram of weight versus four calories per gram of weight. From a pure energy density standpoint, economically, it's more than 
less than half the price to send troops over with fats than it is with carbs. So let's just look at it from the gravy train for a second too. But uh, most of the dietary change that we see does trickle down from the military. You look at how it worked with Ansel Keys. We look at how it worked with, uh, you know, Ansel Keys, the the founder of the low fat diet, if you want to call it that, and the whole anti saturated fat movement. That was the K rations with the military. That was Ansel Keys yeah. setting K rations to the military. Um, and that trickled down into you know through the bureaucratic BS that we have to deal with sometimes, and it took years, but eventually it hit the uh, you know hit the standard population. So I do think that yes, the more that we see high achievers and athletes in the U.S. military being proponents of a lower carb ketogenic diet, I think that we could see it. But unfortunately, I think we're we're decades away from that trickle down effect, um, especially you know once politics and, and money comes into play in different areas too, right? I mean, there's there's people lobbying for different industries, which make it extremely, extremely tough. So it's something that might take decades and a lot of bureaucratic change and bureaucratic just uh, hurdles, but hopefully we're heading the right direction here. Yeah. One thing that kills me about the low fat diet is, is the, or the fact that we are seeing so much detrimental health rises on not just diabetes, but dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, there, there's been a rise in because of the hormone factor that is in with all the sprayed on grains and things mm-hmm. like that that are in there. There, there's issues there with cancer and other things. But it, it's kind of funny to me because our tax dollars go to subsidize to make all this stuff cheap. So we're literally subsidizing our bad health because politicians are making decisions that are against our interest and instead against for the lobbying interest. Yeah. So it just kills me. Yep. yep, you've nailed it. Yep, we're 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 like a like a perpetual motion device of terrible health. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. So we're gonna be uh, close to wrapping up. And before I wrap up, I like I like to ask my guests a, f- a few questions. They're standard questions, and these are one to give people more resources out there. Two to see where there's. Uh, from different perspectives where there's different ways of thinking or consensus. So they're just real quick, short answer questions. And uh, you ready to go for those? Yeah. Hopefully it's not too rapid fire and catch me off guard, but let's go. (laughs) Uh, No, it's not like that. Some people go more (laughs) detail than the others, but they're pretty simple. And and, uh, one of my first questions is always, what three foods do you think everybody should include in their diet? Ah, That's a very good one. Um, Well, I guess I could say it loosely when I say say protein, but I do think that you know some form of high quality nutrient dense fish, you know, some kind of uh, whether it's going to be you know, when I say nutrient dense fish, I mean like a sockeye salmon or possibly uh, oysters or sardines or you know not one of these just typical white fishes that doesn't have a lot of nutrient value. Uh, nowhere else are you going to find bioidentical sort or bioavailable, excuse me, sources of vitamin A, vitamin D. And all the almost all the minerals and some of these trace minerals and some of these things like zinc and selenium they they are just a smorgasbord of tremendously healthy foods so good quality nutrient dense uh, fatty fish uh, secondary I would say it's a tough one but I think I'm going to throw cruciferous veggies in there you know it's going to be you know, broccoli bok choy baby broccoli just especially for men simply because the anti-estrogen effects. And I feel like so much of our society is just impacted by estrogens that are out there everywhere. I mean, in our yeah. water, in our plastics, in everything, our utensils, everything. And it really it affects women, of course, but it definitely affects men because we have a feedback system that can really be impacted by that negatively. And third, let's see, I've got to pick a good, healthy, you know, super fat here. I would say, obviously I'm talking keto here, but I, I would say either avocados or olive I'm going to say avocados instead of olive oil because avocados, you actually get the fiber as well. So I can kill two birds with one stone. So, you know, you're getting the, the lutein, which is tremendous for your eyes. You're getting the, uh, the oleic acid, which is tremendous for different genetic processes and gene expression in your body, tremendous, healthy, stable, monounsaturated fats. And then of course, you're also getting the fiber too. And it's going to be probably the lowest net carb, uh, you know, keto fat, vegetable or at least vegetable that you could consume vegetable like technically it's a fruit i guess but yeah. who's who's counting yeah well you know it's uh the one thing that vegans and and keto people can actually agree on avocados are awesome <laughs> that's one thing i'm gonna make a shirt on that that's good man <laughs> <laughs> so what three foods do you think everybody should avoid uh 
hydrogenated fats, hands down. So I mean, trans fats, hydrogenated fats that are in like a lot of peanut butters and things like that. Uh, I would, the next one's going to be more of, I know I'm going ingredients route, but let's, so let's just say like when you say hydrogenated, when I say hydrogenated, I mean things like peanut butter or um, anything that's going to have hydrogenated fat in it. So a lot of the shelf stable foods and things like that. Um, another food that I would say avoiding, well, I want to say an ingredient again, anything with monosodium glutamate. If you've watched my grocery hauls, I'm like, just guys, like if you have two packets of peanuts right next to each other, the hot and spicy, delicious peanuts that you're getting at a convenience store and one has MSG and one does not get the one without MSG. Um, the next one, I think for just a second here, cause I've got so many pessimistic videos out there that pick foods apart. Um, <laughs> I would tilapia. <laughs> oh God. Yes. Yeah. Tilapia, tilapia. So, um, just a fun fact on tilapia, they can survive on there's perpetual devices to like, or, or ecosystems, they call them where there's chicken and chickens in cages above tilapia, the chicken poop into the tilapia, the tilapia eat the poop and they survive just fine. And then when the tilapia reach the end of their life cycle, they take the dead tilapia and feed them to the chickens and the chickens eat the tilapia and they poop it out. And this can go on for literally generations. That is tilapia like have this keen ability to have zero nutritional value whatsoever. And because they live on such garbage, they are so pumped with antibiotics. So even if it's whole foods, quote, healthy, sustainable tilapia, the fact by their very nature that they are just a crappy bottom feeder is just not, yeah, tilapia definitely makes the cut. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna take a bottom feeder, go for the lobster. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. At least there's an exoskeleton that prevents some of the absorption of like the heavy metals yeah. and stuff in the lobster. Yeah. So plus the nutrient density of lobster is phenomenal. So the uh, a lot of us have, have studied from others. We all stand on the back of giants. So uh, I'd like to find out who are your top five health heroes? What are some as, as kind of resources for other people? And it doesn't have to be keto. It can be health in general. Yeah. You know, the first one is, it's honestly, it's my dad. Uh, you know, my dad passed away from cancer a couple of years ago. And um, it, it's funny because he was a very healthy guy that really paid attention to his health. And it was just, it occurred to me, at that point that we really need to be taking care of things outside of just our normal, um, what we eat. Like we have to look at how things respond within our bodies. So my dad was a healthy Italian guy that consumed largely a Mediterranean diet and he still got taken out by a random cancer, right? And it just goes to show that and it just motivated me all that much more. God, gosh, I had two years, it's gonna be four years in February. I just can't, I can oh, still say two years, it's just time is flying. But, um, and that's like right when my brand started to take off because I got really motivated around that time. Where I was like, I, I got to help people like this. I can't like watching my dad die. So even though he's not like a health crusader, um, you know, I definitely give him some serious credit there. Uh, another one is going to be, I mean, he's someone that's around right now is, is Rob Wolf. You probably know Rob Wolf. Uh, yeah. Big fan of him. And I, I feel like, you know, although my following is technically larger than his i consider him a giant that i would stand on as far as the research because he's just he just does a dang good job of explaining it he takes a real like well-rounded approach um and then in the world of like if we're talking kind of the influencers and people like that i have to rope it into health and business you know someone that just did it so well is mark sisson and i just mm -hmm. appreciate you know obviously in the paleo world talk about a guy that was able to take a message um of health. He was the godfather of paleo, which it arguably has just changed the lives of so many people and was has been much more widely accepted than keto because it doesn't alienate as many foods. I use the word alienate loosely. But then he also put together a brand that he sold to, you know, craft. Wine. Oh, craft. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's like, I just admire him on many levels, what it takes to, and the guy's like, how old? I don't know how old he is now. He's pushing like, 60. He's, yeah, he's and, in his 60s. And he's friggin' shredded. I mean, yeah, he is. Yeah, so I just admire the heck out of that. Anyone that can put the money where their mouth is. Um, and then I kind of get into, you know, a little bit more of the researchers. So, you know, um, Volek, who's done most of the research oh, yeah. in the world of fasting. It's like that. I just, I, he's a lot of research in fasting, a lot of research in keto. Uh, so Jeff Volek, V-O-L-E-K. So just, just like the research that he comes out with um, and his ability to put together studies that are easily articulated and people understand. 
And then, wow, it's hard to pick just five because I don't want to leave anyone really, really good out. So I'm trying to think of someone that's, um, I'm going to go, I'm gonna, still going to say Rhonda Patrick because in the world of mm. fasting, again, like, a, again, someone that uh, can get people excited about it, but also I wanted to make sure that I had a, a good female in there because there's a lot of women that are really leading the charge in the world of mm -hmm. like health too. So um, yeah, all those people, except for my dad, you can't check him out on YouTube. He's probably nowhere to be found, but all these people you can find on YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that, um, you know, highly recommend diversifying, you know, where you, where you get your research. Yeah. You know, you, you always got to look at different perspectives because the, some, some things will not work for you yeah. that work for other people. So it's, it's great to get different perspectives out there. And sometimes something will work for you for a while and then stop Yeah, and you got to change it up. So now my next question is what is one major health myth that you wish you could just get, dispel, get rid of overnight? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to give you two because the first one is one that's kind of an obvious one. Okay. That's the saturated fat thing. Let's put that one to bed. Okay. Let's be done with that. But I think for me, it's the big one of, of snacking. Like I feel like it's uh, I've said it in countless videos. You probably heard me say it, but the magic of metabolic health and the magic of fat loss happens in between your meals. doesn't matter if you're fasting, doesn't matter what you're doing, but in between your meals is when the magic happens. And if you're constantly grazing, then you're never allowing those hormones to do their job. And we have so much food marketing telling us to snack. We have the health crusaders telling us to eat small, teeny meals constantly throughout the day where we never, ever give our bodies a chance to actually tap into our stored tissues or other energy substrates. Um, and to, to rope into that one, it's the, the health myth that's out there. It's just the advice in general that things should be easy it should be difficult. It should be hard in a true, like grinding kind of hard way. Like, like fasting is hard where it's like, it's difficult, but you're achieving something because we're all walking around enabling ourselves by finding crutches all the time. You know, how do we make fasting easier? How do we make dieting easier? It's not about making it easier. It's about changing the mindset around it, but also just changing our perception because the more difficult it is in a true hormetic stress or effect, the better we ultimately evolve and get. So that has to do with not snacking. It might be a little difficult to not snack in between a meal, but I would rather you carve out three square meals a day and eat three larger meals than eat same calories spread out throughout the day. And there's plenty of data to back that up, but I, I feel like that's just a myth that got really, really strongholded by the, um, by like the fitness industry, like in the 90s. Oh, eat these six meals and you'll get jacked. And, but by the way, buy, buy two tubs of protein powder to be some of those meals, you know, <laughs> and the cheapest protein powder you possibly can get, you know, which yeah. is the way that's going to spike your, yeah. 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 I fell into that. Well, there's a, there's a great book called, uh, gut the inside story. And I can't remember the author's name right off the bat, but, uh, they talk about how not just for the hormones and the insulin, but fasting for a period of time, you eat too many meals your gut hygiene gets bad because your yeah. small intestine needs to clean itself out. And it, yeah. it that's that rumbling you hear yeah. is the small yeah. intestine clearing it out. That's your stomach rumbling. Yeah. So what is, if you could change something in the medical industry overnight, what would that be? <laughs> well, that's a really tough one. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause coming out of the healthcare world, coming out of the medical world, um, I, wow. I mean, I think if I really had to get down to like getting onto the reimbursement system and, and getting down to how that works, um, I don't want to say take the power out of pharma because I, I think that like we could leverage pharma to make better choices because I feel like there's like pharma has power. So let's not take the power out of pharma because then we're putting, we take the power out of pharma, then we're kind of going into almost a socialized healthcare that could be like really wacky if we're not careful. But if we, if we, can kind of shift how pharma thinks that's going to be the revenue driver. And that's going to be what changes the paradigm of healthcare. Cause right now it's about how do we get a maximum reimbursable for these illnesses? So I guess at the end of the day, we need to stop, we need to stop congratulating and stop rewarding sickness by giving the healthcare system money when people are more sick, because that's how it works right now. People are more sick, the more sick they are, the more pharma pays and the more the reimbursement and maybe insurance companies pay out. 
and the way that it's all set up in terms of these highly inflated reimbursement numbers, uh, we're, they're rewarded for people to be sick. So there's no real drive or draw for people to get better. There's a drive and a draw to put them on a drug where they keep coming back, where they keep coming back for a pharmaceutical, but then they have comorbidities that are going to cause other issues and they have secondary co-infections that happen with all this and that. And it's just, so if we change like, okay, the problem is if people get better, then it's not a business. So the big overarching thing talking in one big circle is healthcare needs to not be a business, but at the same time, like, then what's going to happen to the insurance companies? Okay. We, we need to, so you can see, I can talk myself in a big circle with it because I understand yeah. how it works and I understand how they make money and like, how are, how are doctors supposed to have the salaries that they're going to have? if there's no, if it's not a business, but then you also like want to make sure that doctors are paid well because they're good, at, should they good at what they do? Um, so I'm sorry, I can't give you like a solid answer on that, but it's, like, right, it's like five answers that kind of come into one. Um, we just need to I, that we're, tre we're, we're treating people to truly get them better, not to just treat a symptom and keep them coming back. Yeah, you know, and uh, another thing, place where we subsidize our own poor health is pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. um, because our tax money goes into a lot of their research that they come out with, and and then you know, so yeah, um, and exactly. I'm not I'm not anti pharmaceutical and stuff, but the one thing I've always had an issue with in the U.S. for socialized medicine is our whether whether what side of the aisle you're on. Politicians in general have an extreme talent of taking a wonderful concept and screwing it up. A hundred percent. That's the thing. We're never, we're, we're, I mean, yeah, we could get political and I'm very middle of the road and I feel like yeah. um, there's socialized healthcare in countries that, that it works. And then there's when, but when we are already commandeered and dominated by the insurance companies, it, I just don't see, I can't see it working in a sense that it would cannibalize itself. So, yeah. and it would end up resulting in crappier healthcare for everybody. So we have to change the minds of like where pharma research is because pharma is driving a lot of our decisions. And it's one thing you yeah. can sit there and you can get pissed off about it, or you can kind of understand that like, okay, like we can try to be the change in this, or we can actually kind of dictate the change for pharma. Because if pharma starts seeing that there's money in a different direction, if pharma sees that, there's, sees that there's money to get people off of sugar and to make healthy moves, shift the mind of pharma to truly make us healthier people, and we can make the monetary financial drive towards making people healthier versus keeping them sick and coming back for more. There's money to be made in keeping people healthy too, truly healthy. So uh, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> oh, it does. And it's, yeah. to me, it's, it's like you touched on earlier, it's changing that reward structure. Yes. Yep. And, and that's, that, I think that's, that's a really great point. And I don't think anybody's brought it up quite in that way uh, so far out of all the times I've asked that question. So I like that, you know, if you, if you reward pharma for cures rather than treatments yep. more, then they're going to focus more on cures. Uh, and, you, and you just distilled what I said even better because you put it down into a sentence. I mean, that's exactly it. They're not, they're not rewarded for cures right now. They're rewarded for uh, quasi-prevention, you know, ambiguous prevention. That's not really preventing. It's just keeping you coming back to the well. It's like a sugar daddy. You know, it's just not, it's not what we want. <laughs> I, I totally agree, man. I could talk to you about this stuff forever. <laughs> like seriously, man. All right. But uh, we do have to close it off because Carrie has to talk to her peeps after this one's done and we need the <laughs> bandwidth. All right. So right. She, Carrie does a, uh, right now she's doing her holiday masterclass, teaching people how to eat during the holidays and cook really delicious foods for this, you know, with their holiday master keto uh, cookbook that she, she wrote years ago so she has this master class it's really cool but she's got to have time to go do that <laughs> so i am i am going to close things out and I, I tom's i i really am, am grateful that you came on the show man i really enjoyed this I, this is something i've been looking forward to since last week and uh well looking forward to as soon as i saw heard you say yes on the the email there and uh i the, i really consider myself honestly great so lucky to to have the opportunity to talk to people like yourself and learn because uh i know you said i'm not your guru before but a guru is a teacher a sifu is a teacher 
you are definitely a teacher, my son. So, well, thank you, man. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close it out, guys. And uh, I just, if you want to support the podcast, help us out, keep things going, go to patreon.com slash Carrie Brown or patreon.com slash the Fatty Joe Show. You can uh, become a Patreon support, get access to private Facebook group, get some swag, and possibly some artwork from yours truly. So we'll, uh, you know, you can check out the levels there. You could also go to the carrybrown.com. That is the master control switch for all the stuff that we do, cookbooks, master classes, all that kind of stuff. And you can go hang out with us at Facebook at the uh, Keto Kitchen with Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker and chill, hang out, say hi, let us know how you're doing. All right, everybody, have a great day. Thank you for joining us on the Fatty Joe Show. Be sure to leave a comment and subscribe. It helps the show reach more people. To support the show, as well as Carrie Brown and Yogi's work on the blog, Keto Recipe Development, Master Classes, and to gain access to private Facebook groups and other awards, go to patreon.com slash the Fatty Joe Show or patreon.com slash Carrie Brown. Also, check out our Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker YouTube channel for video versions of the Fatty Joe Show, recipe videos, and more. Join our awesome community on the Facebook group, The Keto Kitchen with Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker. And check out our CarrieBrown.com website for recipes, blog posts, discounts, cookbooks, masterclasses, and other great stuff. Thank you so much.